Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. My name is Gray Jones, and I want to welcome you to the TV Writer Podcast, episode 46 for Friday, December 23rd, 2011, our last podcast of the year. And I do want to wish you happy holidays. You'll notice that I'm wearing a very festive red color. And my Christmas gift to you, ho, 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 is an interview with writer, producer, author, and international consultant in television and film, John Vorhaus. John is the author of The Comic Toolbox, How to Be Funny, Even If You're Not, a book I highly recommend, uh, even if you're not a writer, and even if you know somebody who needs to be funnier. Um, it's a great book to give as a gift. An excellent, excellent workbook, actually. There's lots of great exercises in there on how to improve your wit. He's also the author of Creativity Rules, a writer's workbook, and The Little Book of Sitcom. You can find out more about his works at johnborehouse.com. He also does work as a consultant. You can find out more on his website. He has a number of other books, some funny uh, novels, as well as books on poker, and he has a blog on that site. And if you want to follow him on Twitter, you can follow him at True Fact Bar Fact, and you can find out more in his video interview, which is coming up shortly. First, I do want to remind you about the contest that's going on right now, and the contest involves reading Ross Brown's Bite Size Television and doing that pretty quickly over the holidays because he's coming up on the podcast in the first week of January. So you've got to get your questions in for that interview by January 1st to mail at tvwriterpodcast.com. And if you do submit questions and you are chosen, you could win an insider's guide to TV's hottest market, Reality TV by Troy DeVold. And of course, Troy will be on the podcast in a few weeks. So it'd be good to buy that book anyway. And if you do win it, hey, you could give that to a friend. And late breaking news, because this interview was actually recorded well in advance of the release date, is that Script Magazine has been acquired by the F&W Media family. I'll read the announcement. F&W Media is proud to announce the acquisition of Script Magazine. Script Magazine, the world's most respected script writing magazine, has served the script writing and filmmaking communities since 1989. Visit us at scriptmag.com, where we will continue the Script Mag Magazine legacy of offering the most comprehensive coverage of the craft and business of writing for film and television. And uh, F&W Media, of course, is uh, the parent of Writer's Digest, an excellent writer's publication. For nearly a century, F&W Media has been a trusted resource for writers. We look forward to introducing you to the F&W Media family through the pages of Writer's Digest magazine. Writer's Digest has a long history of chronicling the culture of the modern writer and continues this great tradition through relevant first-person essays, interviews with best-selling authors, profiles of emerging talent. Every issue of Writer's Digest is devoted to helping writers develop their craft and hone their publishing acumen. Beginning now, you will receive Writer's Digest magazine for the remainder of your Script Magazine subscription if you are a subscriber to Script Magazine. So Script Magazine will continue online. Now, of course, uh, the TV Writer Podcast has been produced in partnership with Script Magazine up until now. Um, and the TV Writer Podcast will continue no matter what. Always go to tvwriterpodcast.com for the latest, or you can go to blip.tv slash tvwriterpodcast for the latest episodes. There will not be an interruption. But um, in the coming year, I will let you know how this acquisition will pan out and uh, and where that will lead with regard to the podcast. So I did want to make you aware of that if you haven't heard already. And uh, I'll be bringing you the same great interviews with writers. So it won't affect the podcast too much, but just wanted you to know. But uh, in terms of the video tips for this week, uh, there won't be an extended video tips, but I just wanted to mention kind of a tiplet. And that's that uh, it is the holidays. And sometimes what happens in the holidays is we do treat ourselves. And as writers... Um, I find it really fascinating because as, as television writers, of course, we have to watch television. And I hear so many people saying they missed the episode because they weren't there to catch it at 8 o'clock. And yet, I mean, we've long had the ability to record TV 
you may even still have a VHS in the house. It works. You can record the show on VHS. There's more efficient ways to do that. You could have a PVR. PVRs are very expensive, but there's a lot of great solutions for recording television on your computer. And when you do that, you can have random access. They can act like a superpower DVR. Um, they can actually automatically find shows even if they shift in their time slot. And there's a lot of great reasons to to record on your computer. So in this uh, holiday season, in the uh, Boxing Week specials perhaps, you might want to look into getting one of the solutions available for your computer. I personally have Max in my house and El Gato is a company that sponsors my Chuck podcast. And I would highly, highly recommend El Gato's ITV products. You can go to their site at elgato.com if you have a Mac, and there are excellent tools for recording in virtually any scenario. You can actually get free high-definition TV just with a simple antenna if you happen to live in a, in a major urban setting like Toronto, New York, etc. Most cities have free um, high definition that they that they broadcast and you can pick up with a very cheap antenna and actually have it come into your computer and record virtually anything that you can have there's they have solutions that you can hook up to a um, a cable box of, of any kind your satellite receiver go to their website check out what they have if you do have a pc uh, there are many many solutions available to to record just walk into your circuit city or or big box store and you can find something to get the tv into your computer once it's there it's very easy to export to your ipod to your ipad to your i whatever and uh, and watch it on your commute and if you have the ability to watch more television and be more in control of the television that you watch it'll help you to be a better writer so little tiplet not a big one this week, just a little one, but I do want to wish you a very, very happy holiday, and uh, and one great way to enjoy the holiday is by watching this interview. Okay, that was a very, very weak segue, but uh, to watching this interview with John Borhaus, I'm sure you're going to love it, and uh, so um, this will be the end. I won't have a conclusion at the end. I do want to wish you a wonder, wonder, wonderful, wonderful, safe holiday season and a very, very happy new year. Do follow me on Twitter to find out what's happening in the coming year. At Gray Jones is my handle. Want to wish you all the best. Enjoy. Bye-bye. This is Gray, and I'm here with writer, producer, author, international consultant in television and film, John Vorhaus. Wow, that's a mouthful. It's quite a mouthful. Yeah. But my, my motto, uh, I guess you'd say my business motto, business model is go off in all directions at once you're bound to arrive somewhere sometime <laughs> yeah and and of course in this business the longer you're in the business you end up doing a lot of things so well you do if you're smart yeah i mean my my career is kind of a um, an object lesson in that i've worked in situation comedy hour drama I've written screenplays i've mm. uh, written movies produced in other countries i've made situation comedies produced in other countries and uh, it's all because i'm flexible and versatile and i think that's a really good quality for a writer to have mm -hmm. well and of course you're the author of the comic toolbox a comic toolbox how to be funny even if you're not yeah i had i had an interesting conversation with a friend the other day where this book has been around for a few years and it continues to sell mm -hmm. and we were we were kind of having a mock debate about why it was why it sold so well and i always thought that it was the pink cover that really made a difference <laughs> he he um he claims that it's the subtitle how to be funny even if you're not and yeah. it makes such a seductive promise to writers, people who want to be funny, but they have some confidence issues. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I think really what drives the success of that book is that it makes it so easy for new writers to experience writing, comedy writing, all kinds of writing, mm -hmm. as something that's easy and fun, and they can engage in it quickly and get success real quickly. And mm -hmm. just, it's, it's like stepping into a warm bath. Yeah. Well, we'll get, we'll get to Comic Toolbox in more detail later, but um, one of the things that I, I love about it, I, th I think why... I think it's it's timeless is that it's not um locked into a certain type of comedy. Um like say for instance you're you're not locked into the current three act format or you're you're mm -hmm. not locked into it's it's uh even as you're speaking like I've I found my tweets getting a little funnier as after reading the book. Like <laughs> um it's it's there's a whole whole pile of different tools for different comic scenarios. And, well, uh, yeah. I mean, the, the, the principles are fundamental mm -hmm. and, and they can be applied across a range. And this is something I've experienced myself as I've moved between back and forth between writing novels and writing scripts. A lot of the same principles of, of 
both comedy writing and story structure mm. uh, pertain no, no matter what you're writing. Interestingly, I've just released an ebook specifically on writing sitcoms called mm-hmm. The Little Book of Sitcom. And obviously that is notionally targeted at sitcom specifically. But as I was writing it, I said to myself, this isn't just about sitcom. I'll give you an example. Mm-hmm. One of my um, pet peeves is character sketches. I hate character sketches like a yeah. cat hates baths. I just don't like to write them. They're boring. They're unenlightening. And I'd much rather discover character through story. Mm-hmm. You, know, you want to find out who your characters are in sitcom. Yeah. Just stick them into a situation, see what the heck they do, yeah. what their actions are, what their choices are. That's going to tell you much more about the characters than pages and pages of character description. Mm-hmm. Well, it turns out that principle is true for novels, it's true for screenplays, it's true for drama, it's true for everything, even though it emerges from a book on situation comedy. Yeah. Well, and, and actually, before we leave com- Comic Toolbox, I actually I loved um, your approach to features. In in the book, how you broke it down like very very simply, and I and I love in particular how you how you said you don't understand it if you can't bubble it down, like if you can't bubble it down to one this particular part to one sentence, yeah. then you haven't got it. And mm-hmm. and uh, um, I know Blake Snyder's Save the Cat was great at at uh, really simplifying, but I think you you go even further. You really simplify the the key parts of a feature, and uh, I found that really really helpful. Well, thank you. You're speaking of what's defined in the book as the comic through line, which is a nine or so step story to breaking out, uh, sorry, structure to breaking out a story Mm -hmm. on its simplest level. Can I tell you the truth? Yeah. The the origin story of the comic through line? Mm -hmm. Perhaps I shouldn't, but eh, time has passed. I took Robert McKee's story structure class way back when. Oh, yeah. And I found it incomprehensible. No knock on McKee. Mm-hmm. It's just that his language was beyond my understanding. Yeah. And so I sat down one day and I said to myself, how can I understand story in a way that I can understand story? And mm-hmm. mostly it was about how can I use smaller words? And that led me to the construction of this comic through line just by mm-hmm. thinking about the stories I was trying to tell and the parts of the story that were important to me. So I guess I owe a debt to Robert McKee for befuddling me so much that I set out to answer a question I couldn't come to grips with otherwise. Yeah. Well, and, and the thing that I love is that when you can bubble it down to the simplest form, you mm-hmm. also have a much greater handle on it. Like yes. it, you can keep it all in your brain rather than having it all on pages. Mm-hmm. And then now, you can shuffle it around in your brain where it's really easy to do that. We um we script writers typically get lost in the middle of the second act, and we mm-hmm. don't know why we're lost. But it turns out that right there in the middle of the second act, there should be something called division of loyalty, mm-hmm. where the character's original loyalty to himself or herself becomes divided and now is in conflict with loyalty uh, that he now invests in someone or something else. And a classic example in the book is you've got Luke Skywalker, whose original mm-hmm. loyalty is to himself, just wants a light, life of adventure. There in the middle of the second act, he acquires a loyalty to the Rebel Alliance. And now he's got to decide, am I going to go off and have my life of adventure or am I going to fight for my new allies? Mm-hmm. And that conflict drives the entire second half of the story. Well, once you understand that there needs to be divided loyalty, you can look for it on, in your material on the simplest level. Yeah. It either there or it ain't there. Yeah, and if it's not there, you got to go find it, hunt it down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very very cool stuff. Now we we can't go too far on that tangent because we got to get to, uh, to yeah, your lot story. To get through. Yeah, lot lots to get through. So why don't you tell me a little bit about where you grew up, went to school, and and when you decided I want to be a writer and how that happened. Well, I took a degree in creative writing from Carnegie Mellon University. Mm-hmm. Graduated from creativity uh, from Carnegie and went into advertising as a copywriter. Mm-hmm. And I pretty quickly decided I didn't want to spend my life making the world safe for advertising. That just didn't wasn't a good fit for me. I knew it. It yeah. wasn't it wasn't meeting my creative needs. So I quit that job and became a singer songwriter. Kind of like oh really? Dude. Oh yes. Yeah. I spent I spent five years on the folk circuit before discovering critically that there were two things I couldn't do particularly well, sing and play <laughs> guitar. Yeah. Uh, other than that, it was, it was a knockout career. And by the way, for anybody who's interested, thanks to the miracle of MP3, uh-huh. I recently digitized the old LP. I made an LP back in the day, yeah. and it's available on, on my website, johnvorehouse.com. And it's, it's good for a laugh just to see what sort of anguish I was undergoing in my youth. <laughs> anyway, I, I beat my head against that career for five years or so, and I wow. said, yeah, this is fun, but... Um, the thing I'm really good at is putting words on a page. Mm. So I came out to California with no 
clearer purpose than to put words on the page that were something other than songs. Mm -hmm. Uh, As so many people have done, I was fortunate to find a mentor who said, I will teach you, but you must do two things. First, you must pay attention and listen to what I'm telling you. (laughs) And second, you have to pay it forward. You have to find someone else to teach. And I didn't realize it at the time, but paying it forward, helping other people learn has become so big a part of both my understanding of writing and and my calling and my passion. I just Mm -hmm. really... My life would not be complete if I couldn't both write and teach. And that's something that I discovered in my early years in sitcom. So I I worked in situation comedy for a few years. I did uh, Wonder Years. Actually, slow down a little bit and tell me how you got your first break. I (laughs) worked. Oh, that's not what you mean. Uh, At the time I was working, it was the the early emergence of pay cable, of Mm -hmm. of over the, um, not pay cable, of free cable. And these off-network opportunities were emerging. Fox mm-hmm. was just coming out. And for someone with some spec scripts and some hustle and just the willingness to beat his head against the phone, I found I could create some opportunities for myself to go pitch. Mm-hmm. And I really didn't understand pitching at all. So I quickly made an opportunity to teach a pitching workshop because I figured if I had to teach other people how to do it, I'd probably be able to <laughs> figure it out for myself. And that is my modus operandi. All, all through my life, if there's something I've wanted to learn how to do, I found someone to pay me to teach it. And uh-huh. kids at home, you should try that. It's a really effective strategy. Uh-huh. Um, and so I just I got pitch opportunities and, and sold some stuff. I think the first thing I sold was an episode of the new Love American style, uh-huh. the long lost and late lamented. Yeah. And uh, and I just worked the grassroots. I had a pretty good trajectory on my career until the first writer's strike I went through in the late 1980s. Mm-hmm. And that kind of caused a tectonic shift in the television industry domestically. Fortunately, at just that moment, the Comic Toolbox came out and it started finding its way overseas and mm-hmm. started creating great opportunities for me to teach and train writers in, well, all over the world, Australia, New Zealand, Nicaragua, Norway, many other countries that begin with the letter N. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so suddenly from out of nowhere, I found myself with a very thriving career as an international consultant. Mm. And and got so much joy out of working well the way i described it is my at that time my business model was uh go to distant places and trade information for experience and money (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) and that seemed like a really good deal so that became the next phase in my career wow wow and you actually um were part of creating a russian version of married with children now i i didn't create it or uh, running it Running it. I ran yeah. the writing staff of the Russian version of Married with Children for two winters in Moscow. Wow. And let me tell you about Moscow at that time of year. You know the expression winter wonderland? Uh-huh. It's just like that, but without the wonderland part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I was there. It was it was a really great and very interesting job because mm-hmm. the way these these format sales work, they'll take an American property and they'll sell the format rights in another country. And then the format becomes kind of at the mercy of the local production model. Mm. Now, in Russia, they were shooting and airing episodes of Married with Children three times a week. Three times a week? Three times a week. Mm -hmm. They were shooting three episodes a week and airing them three times a week. So you can imagine, they burned through 12, 13 seasons of Married with Children episodes in three and a half or four years. Oh, my goodness. But it was really successful, and they wanted to keep it going. So what they needed to do was teach and train writers to develop brand new stories for the Russian version of the characters. Wow. And that was kind of, that was kind of my brief. That's when I was brought in to help this transition into uh, original episodes. And that was very exciting for me because I learned so much. Uh, there's one episode, just to give you an example. Mm-hmm. In Russia, there's a, a holiday called Paratroopers Day mm-hmm. or Special Forces Day. And, and basically, this is the one day of the year where young Russian soldiers get drunk, go out on the street, and beat up anybody they can find. Uh, Good times. Yeah. Well, well, y- if you know the character Bud Bundy from Married with Children, then you can imagine that the Russian version of this character is exactly the same. Yeah. 
you can imagine that he takes it into his head to masquerade as one of these tough guy paratroopers <laughs> in order to avoid getting beaten up. Uh, and as you say in situation comedy classically, hilarity ensues. Yeah. Well, this is this is a story I would never have found in a million years because I don't know about this special forces day. But it yeah. thrilled me. Just thrilled me to be part of that development process. Yeah. So how? I mean, how logistically did you do that? Did you have three staffs to be able to like three groups? Because I mean, the typical uh, sitcom writing is all like leading. Like it takes uh, a certain length of time to make an episode. Yeah, that ain't the way they do it in Russia. No. No. Uh, we tried to get as far ahead of the. Uh, the production juggernaut as we could before production started, mm -hmm. get as many scripts in the can as possible, and then just tried to keep up as production rolled out. Wow. But, but the, the, the assumptions that you make about how a sitcom script is nurtured mm -hmm. in the North American model, that, those assumptions do not apply, not just in Russia, but many, many other places in the world mm -hmm. where the, the, Scripts, because of the economics, uh, the need to shoot so many episodes to amortize cost, mm -hmm. scripts simply don't have a chance to marinate as they do in the North American model. Um, I, the best way I ever found to describe this, I was working in Spain on what was intended to be a five-day-a-week sitcom, a daily mm -hmm. sitcom, based on the soap opera model, the telenovela novel. They could wow. shoot a half an hour of telenovela every day. They couldn't quite pull the same trick off with sitcom because it takes a while to nail the jokes, uh -huh. not just the story and the dialogue. But I said, guys, look, we're never going to make fine wine here. We simply don't have time. Yeah. The best we can hope for is fresh beer and, and trust that the freshness of the product will endear it to the audience's heart. Yeah. And these are the, these are the choices you make because it's wow. one thing I learned working internationally, man, you have to be aware of production realities. Yeah. Uh and and the same is true now as as our uh our platforms extend to the internet. I'm mm -hmm. really really excited by web-based programming, but I'm aware if you can't make it for a dime, you can't make it at all. Yeah. So what you try to do is weave production uh, economics into the premise of the show. Mm -hmm. a great example of that. May I share it with you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Go there, ahead. There, there's a, a show that was done in France and, and then again in Italy. Mm -hmm. And it was basically uh, it took place in a staff room, a break room at, at a school where the teachers met. Yeah. And the camera was placed, according to the conceit of the show, inside a vending machine. Uh -huh. And all the action took place in front of the vending machine no, and in the seriously. tapes you could see beside behind or in front of the vending machine. Wow. And, and so it's a single static camera shot because that's the premise of the show. The premise wow. is we've hit, we've hidden the camera inside this vending machine. Let's see what happens. And they turned the fact that they had no production budget into part of the premise of the show and a real asset of the show. Uh-huh. Wow, that is crazy. Well, I, I, I know it, 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 it is all how you define it. Um, I just interviewed John Finch, a uh, UK writer who wrote A Family at War. I mean, a huge, huge, huge epic uh, serial drama in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And and they they shot ev each episode of this, like, you know, period piece, war, um, serial drama in two days. Holy but, shnikey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they did it. And, and it was tremendously popular and, and, and went around the world. And and yet, I, I hear of of shows in in North America. That, I mean, it's, we can't do it in six days. We just can't. Well, um, in a sense, they can't because they don't have to. Mm -hmm. And in another sense, look, I'm not uh, I'm not an advocate for doing it quick and dirty. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I love to let things grow and and mellow and and find their highest level of quality. Yeah. Uh, and and. Any time I have that opportunity, that's obviously my preference. Mm. But, for example, the the l most recent show I did was a social action half-hour drama in Nicaragua, mm. of all places. Yeah. W working with a nonprofit organization on a shoestring budget with people who really didn't know the first thing about uh, a lot of key production aspects. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, gosh, let's make things as simple as we can yeah. because we're going to have a hard enough time doing it the simple way, let alone trying to do it the hard way. Mm -hmm. So, yep. I, 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 down here on the personal level of what's going to make an individual happy, day in and day out, we're confronted with the choice. 
do I fight against what is or do I accept what is? And some people spend so much time and waste so much energy railing against the awful unfairness of their situation. Mm -hmm. And this is everybody from someone fighting a, a network or a production budget to someone saying nobody will return my phone calls or I can't get an agent. Mm -hmm. All of that is, I don't want to sound too California touchy-feely, but all of that is just wasted energy and negative energy. Mm -hmm. It's a negative spend and it really... For for personal happiness, you're better off letting it go and just saying, okay, this is the situation as it exists. Now, how can I make the most of it? Yeah, which, and, which for the internet webisodes, um, we're all gonna we're all gonna hit that. And I'll give you another example. As you know, or perhaps you don't know, I'm also a novelist. I've mm -hmm. written a couple of really charming novels about con artists called yeah. The California Roll and The Albuquerque Turkey, and they're just great, according to me. <laughs> um, Three or four years ago, when I was uh, selling them, when I was shopping them, my market was big New York publishers. Mm -hmm. And and I, I marketed the book through my agent to a number of different publishers. And Random House was the one that bought the books and brought them out, mm -hmm. where they immediately sank like stones tied to stones, tied to concrete blocks. Not because they weren't good books, but between the time I sold the books and the time the store the the publisher tried to sell them the mm -hmm. whole model of bookstores started to crumble like yeah. you know, just it just fell into dust mm -hmm. so now three or four years later there's no doubt in my mind my market is no longer random house my market is you mm -hmm. and the bad news is that means it's incumbent upon me to do all the marketing and outreach i can to you yeah for example appearances like this. Yeah. But the good news is I'm completely in control of my destiny and completely in control of my work. If I think something is good enough to publish and I'm mature enough, self-aware enough and self-critical enough to know mm -hmm. whether something's good enough to publish, then I can publish it. Yeah. And I can finish it today and publish it tonight and sell it tomorrow. And that's the current reality. Yeah. And a lot of people, a lot of people say, uh, it's not fair. And it's not fair that I'm living in a time when I can't sell books made out of dead trees. Mm. And I say, you know what? It's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just a thing that is. Yeah. And if you're going to prosper in these times, you're going to accept what is rather than fight against it. You have no choice. Yeah. Well, that's that's great advice. Well, why, why don't we talk about some of, some of your books? Uh, I mean, not just the Comic Toolbox, but you've got mm -hmm. the sitcom book. You've got um, – yep. there's one other book, uh, Create, Creativity, Creativity Rules. A workbook, yeah, create, a writer's creativity workbook. Rules, writer's workbook. Creativity Rules is a good, solid work through the exercises book for people who are at a certain stage in their career. Mm -hmm. I always tell people, do the comic toolbox, work through that. If you still want more, then move on to uh, Creativity Rules because it's a little bit more theoretically based. A lot, a lot of stuff on story structure, mm -hmm. a lot of stuff on what I call incremental development which is developing an idea from a one-liner to a paragraph to a skeleton, which is a couple of three pages, to a full outline, and then to a script. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it breaks it down and tells you what should and shouldn't be in these various documents along the way. But I won't make you buy the book to tell you the secret. Uh -huh. When you're looking at, at uh, an idea at almost every level of development, there are really only two things you need. Actions and emotions, hmm. what happens and how it makes people feel. And if you focus on those two things, you can really let everything else go. Hmm. You'll find your story there and you won't get bogged down in details that don't matter, like the colors of people's clothes or what kind of houses they live in hmm. until the very late stages when you can fill in the, the missing colors uh, in the script that, that kind of bring the picture to life. Hmm. I have myself experienced and so many other people seen so many other people experience getting bogged down at the wrong level of detail mm. because they simply don't know that at this point it doesn't matter if the language is pretty doesn't you don't want to fill it up with metaphor or stylish prose you really don't even want to talk about the jokes at this point except mm. to say in a funny situation uh hank gets his tie caught in a threshing machine mm -hmm. and he panics Okay, well, now I know what happens. Hank gets his tie caught in the threshing machine. I know his emotional state. He's panicking. Yeah. And I can pretty well predict it's going to be funny because I know Hank and he's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, and, and, I, and I love um, how you I, – I really get a sense of just speed of development from from your book, uh, at least Comic Toolbox, and I'm guessing that would be the case with your other books, is 
you you move right on to well let's try that with another di- idea why, why don't we go on another idea and and just use this and and you get the idea that like i for a lot of beginning writers they'll just hang on one thing and develop <laughs> it to death rather than getting those mu- those creative muscles just going going yeah going. and 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 the key word in that sentence is hang yeah they will just hang in every sense of that word um in the comic toolbox, I talk about the rule of nine, which mm-hmm. says for every 10 ideas you try, nine won't work. Yeah. And at first blush, that seems terribly negative. But when you think about it, it's a way out of overinvesting in your ego mm-hmm. because you just know you have to go through, plow through tons of ideas to find yeah. the ones that work. Uh, in creativity rules, the, the key idea is change is growth. Without radical change in your work as it develops, it simply is not growing. Mm-hmm. You did get it right the first time because you didn't know the world of your story. You had a great way into your story, but the the reason it was a great way into your story is it brought you into a world you could really explore and mm-hmm. find something interesting. And was exciting now, to you. And was exciting to you. Now that you found all of these exciting things that you want to put together in a package that will sell your loyalty to the original ideas only holds you back Hmm. and and the uh, well friends say that i have a gift for um reducing complex concepts to trivial Mm one-liners and i will stand by that so here's my trivial one-liner for this part of the process yeah it's called platform thinking every level of development is just a platform upon which we stand to reach the next level of development. Mm. If you keep this idea in mind, then you recognize, okay, I built this platform. Now I'm done with it. I can get rid of it. It did its job. It got me up here yeah. so that I could go up there. And now that I'm ready to make that transition, I can let this scaffolding go. I can let this platform go, which basically means let go of all the ideas that supported me this far. Mm-hmm in favor of the ideas that will serve to construct the next platform. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I work in, in editing. That's my main day job. And we'll often have a 46-minute a cut of a 22- or 24-minute show. Mm-hmm. And and there's there's always an impetus to save old versions of things. Mm-hmm. And we never go Ever, back ever go ever. back. You know, one of the great things that computers did for me mm. was uh, I, I learned that I can save daily drafts and they don't take up any more space on my mm-hmm. hard drive. Yeah. I'm never going to outgrow my hard drive. And it, it's exactly that. OK, well, I don't know if this idea is going to work or not. Oh, I'll save it as today's draft and, you know, redate the draft and then I'll try the new idea. If it doesn't work, yeah. I can always go back to the old one. Yeah, never go back. <laughs> you just never, you never do. Yeah. Why? Because the new idea stands on the platform of the old idea. It's better because it draws upon the resources, the creative resources required to build the old idea. The old Mm -hmm. idea never had that. The old idea didn't have that to draw on. Um, There's uh, there's one, I can't remember what sitcom I was working on, but somewhere the idea was, there was a son of a really creative, a creative son of a very creative father. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to get to the bottom of the the difference between their experiences. And the son Mm -hmm. said, well, well, you know, the father says, I didn't have me to help me. Uh-huh. So my, my father wasn't creative and he wasn't in a position to understand what it meant to be creative. So I didn't have somebody saying, go for it, son. This is where your destiny lies. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have the platform of me to stand on. That's why your job is easier because you have me supporting you. And by metaphoric extension, this is what we're talking about. The, the latter versions ha- are the sons of the the former versions and they yeah. draw support from the former versions support that the earliest versions don't have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very, very cool. And, um, I, I think we probably should talk about your poker for a second <laughs> <laughs> just because it's such an important part of your life. It, so it's like, they never, they never cannot. Yeah. Another object lesson. Um, during that writer's strike in 1988, whenever uh-huh. it was, uh, I had time on my hands and I couldn't work. So I started playing poker and yeah. uh, I was bad, really bad. But, uh, you know me, if there's something I want to learn how to do, I find someone to pay me to teach it. Uh-huh. So I reached out to a card magazine. I said, I know nothing about poker, but I'm going to learn. And while I learn, I want to, I want to write about it. And uh-huh. he said, well, that seems like a reasonable pro- proposition. So I started writing about poker as a hobby and a separate revenue stream. Mm-hmm. When poker got hot in the first years of this century, I was perfectly positioned to you know, start writing and selling books. And I went to my agent and I said, you know, in this market, I think I can sell a poker book. And he said, 
and I'll never forget this. He said, I can't sell a poker book. Uh-huh. And then why not? He said, I know I can't sell one, but I'm pretty sure I can sell three. I said, what do you mean? He said, if I can present a series to a publisher, they'll snap it up. If I can give them a brand and tell them it's going to be a repeatable entity, it's, it's a no-brainer. And in fact, it was so great. Uh, the, wow. Because I wanted to write a book called Killer Poker. Mm-hmm. And he said, give me three Killer Poker titles and we're in business. I ended up writing six Killer Poker books and, and then wow. a novel. Then a novel, which was a combination murder mystery teaching tool, a how-to whodunit that not only gave you an exciting mystery, but taught you how to play poker at the same time. That is crazy. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that of all the poker books I've written, all of them taken together Mm -hmm. are not nearly as good as the one I just wrote because I co-wrote it with poker genius Annie Duke, who name you'll know. It's called Decide to Play Great Poker. It has been the number one poker book in the world since it came out earlier this year. Wow. Well, in 2011, depending on when you're watching this podcast. And uh, it, it's just, it's a game changer for the reason I described thus. All the brilliant concepts are hers and all the pretty words are mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. So, uh, but what's really interesting is uh, people, of course, there are no secrets in the, in the electronic age, in the data age. So people who Google me even cursorily quickly stumble upon that poker vector. And I'll go to writing conferences. I love to do writing conferences. And part of my sell is, yeah, and on Saturday night we'll have a poker game. Because mm-hmm. people want that. I mean, there's a tremendous crossover between writing enthusiasts and poker enthusiasts. That's yeah. no secret. And so I, I find the fact that I can come equipped with poker knowledge or nows, as you people of the former British Empire like to say, uh, uh, as long as I can come equipped with that knowledge, it just brings a little something extra to it. And I love it. And uh, and my poker also has brought me to some really sketchy situations. <laughs> if, I, if I may, I'll, I'll tell you one, one oh, thing. Sure, that yeah. I really Go ahead. Discovered, something I discovered about myself as a writer and as a person. Uh, picture this. I'm in Stockholm, Sweden, working on a TV show for the Swedish television network, TV4. Uh. And I get wind of this underground poker game, literally underground, in a club, in a part of Stockholm somewhere. Yeah. And I'm not the sort of person who will get in a cab and say, here's the address, let's go. No, I took the subway to what I thought was the right station. And I, I came up from underground, and I'm standing here in a street corner, and it's a six-way intersection. And I'm turning in slow circles, and I have in my hand a very sketchy piece of information about where this thing might be. And I'm looking around and I'm seeing street signs in Swedish in all directions. And of course, I don't read Swedish or speak Mm. Swedish at all. I'm completely, completely lost. And I realized at that moment, I am in bliss. I am so (laughs) happy. Well, John, why are you so happy? Because I'm trying to solve an interesting puzzle with Mm. incomplete information. Now, I happen to have put myself in this situation where I would have this this puzzle to solve with incomplete mm. information. And what I realized then and what I would commend to my viewers' attention is this is what gets writers rocks off, solving mm. an interesting puzzle with incomplete information. Yeah. Now, you might not be as extreme as me and wander the streets of Stockholm in a, you know, a delirium, but when you sit down to write and you ask yourself, why am I doing this? Mm-hmm. That's the reason right there. Wow. That's, that's exciting to know. Yeah, no, that's that's super. That's super. So, so you mentioned uh, in passing about how you you do seminars and conferences and, and that kind of thing. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, um, for years and years, I've done a version of the Comic Toolbox called the Comic Toolbox. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know it's weird. Uh, two and three day uh, sessions where I just come into a place and teach everything I know about sitcom and mm-hmm. comedy writing in general, basically download it. I also do um, uh, writers conferences worldwide. Uh, I was in Alaska in September. I'm going to be in Wisconsin next. I pretty much have PowerPoint wheel travel kind of Uh, thing. The situations that I like most are the ones where I'm actually involved in teaching and training writers who have been given the assignment to do something they don't know how to do. And this is hmm. common in emerging markets. We used Russia as an example. I've worked in Romania as an emerging market, Nicaragua as an Hmm. emerging market. I love going to places where... Exper- expertise and especially critically experience and mentorship is thin on the ground. Mm. And I get in there and just teach my ass off until all the teaching is done. The, my goal as a teacher is to train myself out of a job as quickly as possible. Uh-huh. And whether oh, that's, that's a, whether that's a, like I'll do a, a half day seminar on comedy in the workplace for c- corporations. 
mm-hmm. whether it's that or a six month stint in Bucharest, because why the heck not? Yeah. Uh, the goal is always the same. Just, just dispense with my knowledge in a way that people will find really useful and give them stuff they can take away now today and employ in their daily lives. I always describe the heart of my work as rules, tools, and a good swift kick in the motivation. Mm-hmm. Very, very cool. And you do have uh, you have a website, johnborhouse.com, but also John- radarenterprises.com. Well, Radar Inter- Z. It, it's the same site. Oh, okay. See, the, see, the hero of my con artist novels is named Radar Hoverlander. And I'll tell oh, okay. you a funny story about that name in a second. But uh, somewhere in the novel, he references that as a con artist, he, he maintains a uh, – a web presence called Radar Enterprises. And uh-huh. I thought, well, I'll block up that website. So uh, the two lead to the same place. JohnVorhouse.com is where you can find all that information about all my books and the mm-hmm. poker and the rest of it. Now I have to tell you about that name, Radar Hoverlander, oh, because sure, yeah, it's yeah. another object lesson in how creativity works when it's working effectively. Um, I have friends who work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, and they were mm-hmm. telling me about the technology for putting uh, rovers down on other planets, Mars missions and whatnot. And the technology is something called a radar guided hover landing device. It hovers over the surface of a planet mm-hmm. and uses radar to guide the landing of this rover. So otherwise known as a radar hover lander. Yeah. And when I heard that phrase, I said to myself, that is the most awesomest name for a character I've ever heard. <laughs> but it's got to be a pretty special character because you, you have to earn a name like yeah. that. You can't, you can't, you have to be able to wear it and rock it. And then I thought, well, a con artist could rock that name. So yeah. I invented this con artist named Radar Hoverlander and started to find out what kind of worlds he was involved in. And, I've written and two hilarity of them ensued. And hilarity ensued, yes. <laughs> cool. And, and, and nefarious behavior also ensued. Yeah. And this is another great thing about being a writer. You get to be in worlds you can't be in in your real life. Hmm. And, you, and, and you get to live scenarios vicariously and really, really get a lot out of them. Mm-hmm. Very, very cool. And you also yeah. do consulting? Yes, I also do consulting. I, I have kind of kind of um, strict um, qualifications for the people I consult. Most mm-hmm. of my consulting clients are screenwriters. They have a screenplay or a screenplay idea that they want to develop. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing that I'm most interested in discovering before I work with someone is whether they have two qualities, um, self-awareness and service to the work. Mm. Now, self-awareness means that they're not going to get, I'm not going to have to fight ego battles with them because I'm going to be able to explain to them this isn't an ego issue. This is a story issue or a character issue or a plot issue or a joke issue. Mm. It's not about you and how you feel about yourself. If I get the sense that I'm going to have to fight ego battles with people, then I don't take them on as clients. Mm. I want I want to work with people who are devoted to, as I am devoted to, service to the work rather than service to the ego. Hmm. If, if, and, and I'll ask them, I'll, I'll say, before I take them on as a client, I'll always consult with them. I'll call them on the phone and say, look, I'm going to ask you a question. If I tell you everything except the title needs to be thrown out and you have to go all the way back <laughs> to square one and start yeah. this over, and maybe even the title as well, can you cope with that or is that going to kill you? I'm not saying I'm going to find that when I read your work, but I'm saying it's a possibility and I need to know in advance whether you can embrace that possibility. Because yeah. if you're just looking for someone to rubber stamp your stuff, uh, then I'm just stealing your money and what I charge, I wouldn't feel good about myself for that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, any writer who works professionally has to be prepared to have that level of commitment to the story and not to their ego. And yet that's... Uh, well, you, you, you put the, the conditional. Any writer who works professionally yeah. has to have that commitment. Writers don't come to that commitment without struggle, mm. and it's part of what makes them professional writers. Now we're talking about what I call the writer's life or the practice of writing, yeah. how you get to be the kind of productive, effective, day-in and day-out writer you want to be. Well, let's talk and about a lot that of, for a bit. Well, a lot mm. of that has to do with coming to terms with your ego issues. Mm-hmm. Classic story from my youth. I wrote a script. I don't even remember what it was. And I don't remember what the joke was. But my wife, who was my editor at the time, Uh said, this this joke's not funny. I don't get this joke. And without thinking, and to great relationship detriment, I blurted out (laughs) the following words. True fact. Hand to God. I said, then you must be stupid. Oh, no. (laughs) Can you imagine? And yet we're still happily married after all these years. Because I learned. She wasn't stupid. She didn't have the same 
um, understanding of the line that I had. Maybe she uh, didn't have the references that I knew, or maybe it just wasn't that funny, you know? Yeah. And what I discovered, what I, re- what I really found helpful was, even if I believe in a joke, it's okay to throw it away because there's always another joke hiding behind it. Mm. And once you get used to that, throw away the joke. Yeah. Then, then a lot of the ego stuff starts to break down. But writers who prosper must necessarily go inside themselves. Mm. They, they have to find out everything that makes them tick or they don't get past these fundamental blocks to their creativity. Mm. Cause it's, because at minimum, it's hard work. And from an ego point of view, it is brutalizing, especially when you're getting rejection from people you know are, how shall I put this, not the last float on the clueless parade, but they can hit it with heavy <laughs> rock from here. Uh, and you just say, why am I letting this moron stand in judgment of my work? Well, probably because this moron controls your paycheck, which yeah. is it's not an inconsiderate consideration. And I'm not saying you should pander to people or give up or not fight, but just recognize that you're fighting. If you're fighting for your ideas, that's fine. But if you're fighting in defensive ego, it's almost never right. Mm. Yeah, very, very cool. Well, we are getting to the, toward the end of our time. And what we always do toward the end is have breaking in tips. Now, I know that you you cover a lot of things. I mean, feature writing, everything, stand up and everything. But but imagine just somebody wants to break into television, either sitcom or, or, um, or dramas. What would your advice be? Well, um, let me start with a, a bit of self-serving advice, if mm-hmm. I may. Um, I have just published a new ebook called The Little Book of Sitcom, as I mentioned, and mm-hmm. that can be found at my Amazon author page, which just go to Amazon and search John Vorhaus and you'll yeah. find all my books. But it's, it's available exclusively through Amazon for reasons that have to do with marketing and, or laziness. I'm not sure which. Uh-huh. Uh, but it's a, it's a terrific book for beginning sitcom writers, and mm-hmm. I definitely recommend it to your attention. Beyond that... Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer your question by going all the way back to the beginning of this discussion. I told you that I started out as a singer songwriter. Mm-hmm. Once upon a time, I was on a bill at a folk festival. I was way, 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 way down at the bottom of the bill, and up on the top of the bill was an old folky named Tom Paxton, of whom you may have heard. Mm-hmm. And at that point, I had just released my first record album, and I went to him and I said, "Mr. Paxton, I've just released my first album. What should I do next?" He said, "Make another one." Keep making them until they make you stop making them. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I obviously took my career in a different direction, but I took that advice with me and Mm. remembered as I went forward, the last script is not important. The next script is important. And the number one thing that new writers need to do is keep writing and keep generating new material, Mm. not just because it builds your portfolio, but because most crucially, it teaches you what you need to know about doing this job. Mm. People, People go into writing with some kind of artificially enhanced expectations. They think they're going to write their first script and sell it. And if they do, God love them. Yeah. You know, wonderful. But I can promise you that your first script, if you sold it, it's because you got lucky, not yeah. because you knew what you were doing. Maybe you knew what you were doing, but probably you didn't. You certainly didn't know what you were doing as well as you will know after you've written 10 or 20 scripts. Hmm. So keep so keep writing. Don't rest on your laurels because you don't have laurels yet. And then the other piece of advice I would give is save your ego for the award ceremony. <laughs> Hopefully don't bring that out then either. That's kind of ugly. But Well, no, it's just it's just a way of saying if your ego is engaged in any part of the process before the thing is done, it's it, it doesn't belong there. Yeah. And if you're a new writer, your ego is going to be brutalized for a long, 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 long time because you are a new writer. Mm-hmm. I can go on and on about this. I'll mention one other, one other thing. Nothing sure. matters. Nothing, nothing matters but words on the page. So much of what daunts a young writer is, how do I get an agent? How can I get anybody to pay attention to me? How do I gain exposure? All of that stuff is important, and you have to work at it. You have to promote yourself. There's no doubt about that. Mm-hmm. But but that all that stuff comes attendant upon or connected to despair. It's easy to get uh, – lost in the feeling that I'm, I'm not making any progress toward my goal. I'm, I'm, I'm here in a swamp and I'm never going to be able to get out. Well, mm. the only way out is words on the page. And really, that's where your joy lies. And I say this from the long experience of a lifetime as a writer. Day in and day out, things drive me crazy. They vex me. They break my heart. Rejection, setbacks, um, lack of sales, lack of money, all of these things are kind of part and parcel of the writing experience. But when I turn off the phone and open up that file and get into the world of my story, all that stuff goes away. And when it's away, I'm not just happy. I'm in bliss. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm delirious. I'm God. And 
then I don't care about the people who aren't returning my phone calls or why my agent's not paying attention to me or where did Random House go. Um, none of that matters. The only thing that matters is words on the page. And again and again, over and over, words on the page is the way out of every single trap. Because if this script didn't get you the attention you wanted, the next script might. You're not going to know unless you write the next script, but you certainly will know it's not going to do you any good if you don't write it. Mm. So, so both for reasons of soul health and happiness and for reasons of productive career advancement, just keep writing. Everything else takes care of itself. Well, that is a wonderful place to end up. And uh, one, one thing I can't forget is uh, your Twitter handle is? <laughs> My Twitter feed is at True Fact Bar Fact. At now, True Fact at Bar Fact. True, at True Fact Bar Fact. Now, this postulates that there are two classes of reality, things that are true and things that sound true in bars late at night. Uh-huh. And, and I've long played this game of True Fact Bar Fact where I'll just challenge people to think about something that might be true, might not be true. Did you know that Michael Jackson had the stump of a sixth finger on his left hand? That's why he wore a glove. True fact or bar? You decide. <laughs> uh, bar Total bar fact. I just made it up off the top of my. <laughs> That's funny. So, okay. So, true fact, bar so, fact. So on my Twitter feed, true fact, bar fact, I do some true fact, bar facts. These days, I've been mostly posting stunt words that are mm-hmm. made up words. Yeah. Because I I have a new campaign, a thousand new words by Christmas of an indeterminate year. Uh-huh. I'm, deter- I'm determined to make up a thousand <laughs> new words, and and I and I spew them yeah. you know, liberally uh, through my Twitter feed. Uh huh. And very, then very I'm fun. very so, cool. And you do blog as well on your site. I blog on my website. I'm on Facebook. It's part of the modern world. I'm not yeah. a I'm not I'm not particularly adept at all that stuff, but I stumble along. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I really, really appreciate you taking the time. It was great to virtually meet you on on the podcast here. And uh, best of luck to you over the holidays and in the new year. And uh, um, please keep giving us this stuff. This is awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, with that in mind, I'm gonna I'm gonna close with the best advice I ever heard mm-hmm. ever about sure. having a creative career, and that's this: keep giving them you until you is what they want. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, well, thanks, John. And, My uh, pleasure. Yeah. Okay, see you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. Mm-hmm.